I just remember, and Drew was always so bummed because he was like, why can't I quit my job? I fucking hate rolling fucking Raiders of the Lost Ark posters. It's fucking stupid. But I was like, yeah, but isn't it cool like when the fucking shitty punk band, they come through and five people come out and we could still give them 200 bucks? He's like, yeah, but it'd be cool to not work. <laughs> Welcome everyone to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, a giant thank you to Midtown for letting my band Lehmeyer open for you guys last Saturday at Starland Ballroom in Sayreville, New Jersey. It was fucking epic and it was probably one of the best moments of my life. So I just want to thank you guys so much and also thank you to Jettison for opening for us last Thursday at the Stanhope House. Both shows were so fucking awesome. Totally worth the trip to New Jersey. And um, yeah, it was great. Um, I Words can't describe how awesome it was, especially the fact that I've talked about for so many interviews how I've always wanted to play in a, a big show. And it finally came to fruition, which is just gnarly. So thank you again. And a giant thank you to Rob Hit. You are awesome. You've been nothing but great to my band and me for the last couple of years since we reconnected. And um, yeah, so I will leave it at that. Much gratitude. Thank you. Asshole Parade. What a great segue. Asshole Parade. Asshole Parade is a hardcore band from Gainesville, Florida. They released two LPs and an EP on No Idea Records, as well as some compilation appearances. They have short, aggressive songs that only two of Asshole Parade's original members are left in the current five-piece setup. Thank you to Drew from Ashtray Monument for connecting me to Matt, who I am got on the Skype, and this is what we chat about. Not playing Fest this year. The Mythios of Gainesville. The serial killer of Gainesville from many years ago, owning the hardback, joining the band, did the name affect them, playing in Japan, Hawaiian t-shirts, and a ton more. If you want to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash this was the scene and sign up for a dollar a month. That is, I keep saying like three and a half Starbucks coffees a year, but technically it's like two and a half now. But it's really helpful of keeping the lights on to this thing. And uh, you could also just do a one-time donation and go to thiswasthescene.com. There is a donate button there, or you could buy merch. Any money that comes this way just helps pay the bills for uh, basically hosting and doesn't cover anywhere near the time that I put into it, but it's super appreciated. And uh, I thank you greatly if you would do that. That's all I got to say. So feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who loves some punk, rock, nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Cool, man. Yeah, so this podcast is really just about the late 90s scene, even though you guys have had a, you know, you've been, you started, it seems like 95, and you came in, as Wikipedia says, in 98, but are still playing. So I'm, I'm really, I'm fascinated by that because you guys saw this spectrum. I mean, you saw this giant spectrum of the late 90s until now. So it's going to be cool to get your, like, perspective. But, um... Before we kind of, so then it's going to go back in time and start as like an origins and lead up to pretty much now, since there's a lot of story there, but wh- how is, uh, how was Fest? You guys just played that. Um, Fest was great. Asshole Parade. I don't, what's the tenor of the interview? Is this Strike Force or what are we talking about? Just me as a human? No, <laughs> we're talking about Asshole Parade. Asshole Parade, right. Okay. I couldn't remember. Um, so Asshole Parade did, we did not play Fest. I work for Tony at Fest. Fest was fantastic. It's it's interesting as Fest has evolved, it's just become pretty succinct and efficient uh, as, on the working side. Um, there's not a lot of surprises, which is awesome in terms of function and, and how things go and schedule and things like that. I also feel like a lot of the people that come here for Fest kind of get it. And so they make running it so much easier. So it's great. You know, Asshole Parade historically has pay, played Fest a ton. I got to be honest. We're <laughs> I love our group. I love everybody in the band. We are wildly inconsistent. <laughs> so we have canceled on Tony so many times that this time I was I just took our name out of the hat. There's kind of a standing offer for us all the time. Uh, which is so generous from Tony. I mean, I go back, Tony is the organizer of Fest uh, down here in Gainesville. Doesn't he own own No Idea? No, no, no. 
Uh-uh. Okay, so or someone that wasn't someone from No Idea a part of it? Uh sort of. I mean, I don't know, we could do a whole hour, 3 hour, 9 hours on that if you wanted to. Uh but but no. Uh no one no affiliation whatsoever. Uh, really Fest has been run by Tony for the whole time. It was his idea. Uh, it's his baby. It's his job now. So, uh, yes. At one point, did Tony work at No Idea? Yes. Oh, that was uh, So, it. obviously, there's some conflagration there, for sure. And I also worked at No Idea for a million years, which you can also kind of see the crossover to that point. I actually got Tony the job at No Idea. I don't know how much of this kind of shit you want to... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is perfect, because No Idea is totally part of that scene, so all of this stuff makes total yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I met Tony... I don't even remember now, 93 or 94. I was in a band a long time ago that went on tour. Tony's from Roanoke. I used to do, was in Book Your Own Fucking Life, if you remember. That's how a lot of bands went on tour back then because there was not a lot of resources uh, in terms, especially for DIY bands. Basically put an ad out in MRR and hope someone cares about your band and calls your home phone and you're sitting next to it. That was a lot of the way that you would do things. And so Tony was always super active when he was younger, still is. And he set up shows in Roanoke and and did a show for the band I was in. And we just became friends and we started training shows. And eventually he moved down to Gainesville. He became friends with a lot of different bands from our town. I'm sure you know that Gainesville was really active in the 90s in the punk scene. Uh, he became really good friends with the guys in Less Than Jake, um, if you know them. And he uh, went on Warp Tour with them a few times, which is kind of where the origins of Fest lie, to be honest. But again, that's not really my story to tell. That's more of Tony's. Anyway, when he moved down here, he moved down here initially with, I think, the intent of working for Less and Jake more full time, maybe Roadie full time, that kind of, they were well on their way. They were on a major label and, and super active by that point. And they had a pretty sizable footprint in town as far as, you know, people working for them, with them, in their org kind of thing. It just ended up making more sense for him to come over to No Idea. Just his lifestyle, what he was wanting to do and and you know, that kind of thing. He had been working with Fuel by Ramen, which was Less Than Jake's label at the time. That's also kind of a misnomer. It was really just Vinny's label. Vinny was the drummer in Less Than Jake originally. And Vinny was really kind of the, the brains of a lot of different things that swirled around their band and their kind of universe, especially on that side of things. And so he was really the one that started Fuel by Ramen. And he and Tony were great friends and still are. And he's still around and, and it's still awesome. But it just made more sense for Tony to come over to No Idea, which was great. And he was worked with us for a long time over there. And then Fest started when he was working there. And so I've been a part of every Fest, you know. So whatever. I mean... So, I mean, but, but, but again, that's, I don't think that's the story you want to talk about, but I work, I still work for Tony. Um, I work with Tony, whatever the, the best, better semantic is. I used to play Fest a million times when it first started. It's, I don't know if you've ever been to Fest. I went, I went last year for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Last year was so weird. Um, only because of the COVID thing. Yeah. I felt like it was, uh, it was a, I, I thought it was great either way, but I was, you know, I could feel that there were probably less people there because of COVID and all that. But well, that was intentional. Worked. So this doesn't matter, uh, but Tony sold way less tickets last year on purpose. Uh, he restricted it because he wanted to make sure everybody felt comfortable. But the the more important part about that dynamic is just you've seen what Fest looks like. It's kind of that South by Southwest model where it's different venues in a small area of town. The way that they sell tickets or the way that Tony sells tickets is he basically adds up the venue capacity of all of it. And then that's how many tickets you could sell, right? Because you don't want to sell more tickets than fit. And it kind of would suck if 
that's why it sells out. You know, you don't want to show up and it's like, cool, I just sold 40,000 tickets. Not that he would sell that many. And there's only capacity for half that. So that's how he does it. And so for 20, what year is this? For 2021, he ha like went way down from that in order to, to lighten the, because some of the venues get, I mean, butts to nuts and which is kind of what you want. But at the same time, when you're dealing with a COVID situation, you don't want to freak people out either. I mean, that was it took a lot for him. And again, this is more of Tony's story to tell. And so if you want the ins and outs of this, you should really connect with him. But and he does this kind of shit all the time. But I just remember 2020, he really was trying to do fest still because you got to put yourself back in that mindset you know, where, oh, it's cool, it's March, right? So everything they do is is so far in advance, like with anything. Lineups and tickets are announced in March and April, right? So, okay, pandemic hits. Fest is still announced in 2020 because it's, oh, this is going to last a month or whatever this is. Nobody knew, or Tony included and Fest included, whatever. And so he really wanted to make a go of it. It just became untenable. None of the venues were wanting to honor their commitment, understandably so. And and a lot of the bands backed out and just it just was weird. There were still people wanting to come. But I mean, this is like before there was vaccine, before there was any kind of information on what you knew about what this was. It was you're still in this kind of insane, amorphic myth era where you didn't really think that that was still possible in the age of connectivity, but it is, and it was, and it was insane. It got canceled, I think, what, August or July, August, maybe September? I can't remember. He was kind of undaunted. You got to understand that this is what he does for a living now, too. So he was going to do it again. He really wanted to get to 20, right? That was always the kind of goal anyway. When he went back to book last year, Fest 19, he had commitments from a lot of the bands that were supposed to play the year before. And it just, that part was a little bit weird, if you remember, right? Yeah, it like, was so many bands, like, backed out. Right, 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 right. So, like, I mean, and not to, you know, you don't want to get specific with names unless you want to, but it just it just didn't work. Right. So like, just for example, Baroness is, you know, John is an old friend. They got added what three weeks before because it was like, fuck, everyone's backing out. Not because they don't want to play fest, but just, they don't, the travel thing, they didn't want to fly down. It just, they didn't want to be around a lot of people. Also, one thing to bear in mind is like a way bigger component to fest than you think is international which sounds bananas because the expense to attend fest from international destinations is really kind of impressive but it's nuts and i can say that because they came back this year and this was the biggest fest that there ever was in terms of attendance and this one that just passed it was awesome but it was you felt it, you know, all those international people back all and the vibe they bring is so intense and amazing. And all the things that you are jaded and kind of take for granted, they're just wrap their arms. But not that the people in the States aren't as well, but there's this extra level. I think when you bump into a kid from Australia or from Germany or from the United Kingdom, who's like, I can't believe I'm in Gainesville. I have no illusions about the city I live in or town really. But for some people, there is this kind of endless fascination with Gainesville. You know, if you're into a certain genre or era, it is kind of like what DC is to me. I remember if you want to go Astle Parade, I remember the first tour we did in Europe was in 99 and we were there for fucking ever. It was like the longest tour I've ever been on. And I was always so blown away by every single night, no matter what, there'd be a kid who'd be, oh my God, you're from Gainesville, blah, 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 you know, because, you, know, you know, information was so much harder to, to come by then. And so it was 
I got to know about this. What about this? What about in the, the, le- the depth of knowledge that you would get from a random kid in Belgium or Italy or Spain was just so endearing. I was blown away, you know, I mean, so much that I would take for granted. Like, I'm not going out tonight. Fuck the same bands. That was what people were like dying to know about. And it was awesome for me to, to again, appreciate that all, all anew because fresh eyes and, and you know, that, that kind of sense of, yeah, you know what? <laughs> it is kind of cool, but that's the local band to me, you know, when you turn it around and be, you're in Belgium and you're like, holy fucking shit, let's, you know, I'm going to talk about the crust scene from the 80s, and oh my god, you got to see Heresy, and but whatever, you know, whatever the the shit you're into, and so I, that exchange was one of the best parts of that tour, because it was a, it was my first time overseas, it was first time our, our band had been there, and, and so we were connecting with a lot of people in, in an awesome way, and, and the exchange I thought was was pretty incredible. Well, let's go back to like when you, because this is a great segue into you getting into the band and you being from Gainesville. Because I mean, Gainesville, when I grew up, my band, like we, that was our, our goal was to play in Gainesville. We played a show one time. It was, this, I don't even know where the fuck it was. It was nobody there. And I was like, God damn it, this sucks. But when I went to Fest last year, I had a blast because I thought, A, just a big shout out to you guys. The app is fucking fantastic. And just being in the town, I was like, oh my God, I finally made it. I'm here in Gainesville. And you walk around, you're like, okay, it's like, it's just a regular town. But it was, it was so fucking cool to be there because that's 18 year old me was dying to, to go there. No, I get it. And maybe because the technology, you have to understand Fest started in 20, 2001. If you take your, I don't know. I don't know when the first smartphones came out, but I think it was like 10 or 11 or it definitely wasn't pervasive until somewhat recently in the last five, six years. I mean, obviously they've been around, but I mean, now it's fucking everywhere. Right. And I only bring it up because the first couple fests, everything was still print. We just had a So you didn't come this year, but one of the things I do for fests is I do most of the writing for the guidebook. Tony, because it was 20, Tony wanted to do a, a lot of historical stuff. So I wrote about a lot of older venues that are no longer in rotation and just some novelty stuff about Fest because it's funny. You know, 20 is one of those bars where you can dip back and, and have a good time with. In, in the same way that uh, Asshole Parade did a 20-year anniversary show, which is bananas, uh, years ago now. But it was awesome, and we were able to – get a lot of people to come out for it that we wouldn't have normally, you know, and it was fucking great. But the point was, I guess the point was in a lot of that early years before there was the, a phone app, like you mentioned, I would write all this stuff that would go in the printed guidebook. Like, for example, I would do a scavenger hunt for Gainesville, like punk history. I had a little map that would be inserted that would that would show you, hey, this is where this punk house was. This is where this was. This is if you ever were into something like this, this is where it happened. Because I was coming from it from a standpoint of, man, you know, I first time I went to see DC and I, I got to go to D- Discord and go to the Discord house. And that was the exact questions I asked. And they're always so incredible. Just working, no idea. I had relationships with with a lot of the people that work there, and Var, who owned No Idea, was friends with Ian, and so always so hospitable. And so that was the mindset that I came from: of Hey, if you if you were really into this scene, what would you want to know? And at heart, I am a fan of all that kind of shit. And so I would put a lot of that into it, but. Then it was different, right? I think if I would do it now with the phone app and with the way people are connected, it would work way better. I just people seem a little bit disconnected from it now. Now it's more about romanticizing fest, which is what it should be, right? Not just like historically the Gainesville part of it. But that was my point. Sorry, we can go back to what me joining Asshole Parade. <laughs> Did that, that, I mean, that was that's great. That gives me that's that's a lot of awesome information about this whole thing. But it may brings up a point because I'm thinking about from being, you know, Gainesville and the band, were you, were you living in Gainesville and then joined the band or did you join the band and move to Gainesville? I moved to Gainesville in 92. 
that's the best place where to start, right? So I kind of, this is a funny story, maybe, maybe a little macabre. I don't know how old you are. 43. Uh, okay. So I'm a little bit older than you. And it's, it's only funny because I don't know if you, how much you know about Gainesville, the city. In essence, the core of Gainesville is the University of Florida. That's really the reason the town is of any note. Um, it goes a lot of the most jobs and it's kind of the hub why people come here anyway. So I graduated high school in 92. So in 19, between 1989 and 1991, there was a serial killer in Gainesville, the Gainesville murders, if you remember. Danny Rawlings, it was right after Ted Bundy killed all the sorority girls in Tallahassee. So there was just this really paranoia about that kind of behavior. I mean, as there should be. So this guy, Danny Rawlings, over the course of, you know, year and a half, he killed six people pretty like mercilessly. The reason I bring it up is because it was really big in the news cycle at that time. And it led to this massive depression in admission to the University of Florida. People were unenrolling in droves. And so it became way easier to get into UF in the window that I applied. I was uh, into, let's say, questionable things when I was in high school, right? I loved the drugs. I loved uh, the nightlife, the underworld, right? Going to shows, punk bands, playing in punk bands, all that stuff. I grew up in Miami, and there was a ton of fun stuff down there to get into. Oh, so you grew up in Miami. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was born and raised in Miami, and then I finished high school, and I didn't want to live with my mom anymore. And for whatever reason, I didn't even consider staying in Miami. I was weird. I just kind of was in this like weed fog of, all right, this is what you do. So I applied to college and I didn't have good grades, but I had really good test scores, right? And so I got into UF and they even gave me a scholarship. So that's why I moved to Gainesville. You're, uh, what's the word? You're saying that this happened because yeah because they didn't have any they didn't have the right amount of people to pick from i mean my gpa in high school is two two right so like and i got a florida scholars which is like you know academic bright futures shit you know did you did you finish four years i did but i lost the scholarship at first semester because i'm i was still into doing drugs and playing in bands and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not prioritizing school in one of the stipulations is you have to maintain a certain GPA, which I absolutely did not. I still, to this day, I, I talk about it with some of my friends. I really am fascinated that I did finish school. It's, I don't know how, to be honest. I, I remember vaguely, but it was kind of insane. I will say this too, just timing wise. I was one of the last university because I finished college in 96 And I still, my senior thesis was a handwritten. There was no computers yet, like least not required. When I I remember going in to do drop ad, you still had to stand in line. It was all that shit still. It was kind of interesting. The point of that is I got here in 92, right? I guess I'm a little bit long winded. I'm really sorry. No, it's really fun. Well, when I got here, I, you know, I, I, so funny, funny enough, I knew some people the guys in, again, I don't know how much you know about Gainesville, but the guys in Radon grew up in Miami, but they're older than me. But I knew them a little bit. When you're three years, when you're 18, or when you're really, when you're 15 and you and the other person's 18 is a pretty wide gulf. So that's the ages they were when they moved away from Miami. But I still knew them. When I came to Gainesville, they were really getting going and they were really the most popular band, punk band in town. And so I was over the moon, right, to, to, to know them. And, and we weren't like homie homies, but they were always sweethearts to me and would tell me about shows. And when I started doing shows, they were super helpful and it was awesome. This is a question. This, is, this, I, this might be a stupid question, but do you think like, and I've never heard of this. I, I think maybe I've heard of that whole serial killer guy, but, and, but the, do you think the fact that that cleared the way and dropped so much um, attendance at the college opened up a space for the punk scene to start thriving? No, I don't think so. Um, because most of the punk scene didn't go to school. I was more of an anomaly than than a, a typical one. 
Well, it just seemed like if all the clubs were more, if they're a lot more dead because no college kids are there, they're like, well, how are we going to no, get more kids to come uh, I love the theory, but I wouldn't, I don't think I would back it. I think the the separation, but they, it's so funny. They call it town and gown, right? Which is fucking stupid, but <laughs> that's the, the division between the actual city and the college is so severe that there's not a lot of overlap like whatsoever, which is super disappointing. I mean, man, I don't know. I used to be like super active doing weird shit. I'll give you the example that comes to mind is I, I like to celebrate big events. There was this band called the Discount from Florida in the 90s. They became really popular. Their last show was here in Gainesville, and I did this thing. I put on the show. And I did this thing where I did an oral history of Florida punk wise from nah, 79 to, to that point, which I think was 2002 or three or somewhere in there. And I did it. It was interview style. It was kind of cool. Like I, I not to I thought it came out well. Not to toot your own horn, I guess. Yeah, saying. that's that sounded fucking super tooly, but no. I thought it landed right. There you go. And what I did was I had all these slides of different cities in Florida, you know, like basically I had a map of Florida and then the slide would kind of highlight an area that the story was corresponding to because I had pre-recorded all of the interviews and then I played it over the loudspeaker throughout the show. So basically while there was changeover, you know, you'd see a thing and you'd see Orlando, Florida and Orlando, and then there'd be a bunch of stories about Orlando or Miami, or Tampa, or whatever. The Gainesville one, there was a couple of them, and they're all fucking hilarious. I tried to to piece it out, new and old. I didn't want to just be like, in the 70s, because that's lame. And I also didn't want to be like, last week, Hot Water Music played again. You know, I didn't want to do that either. So I tried to pick... I'm, I love collecting myths. It's one of my, my... One of the reasons I love punk. I loved the way that information was disseminated when I was a kid. You know, the way you had to find out about bands was either taking a shot on a record, which back then 50% of the records you bought totally sucked because you didn't know, you're just buying it off the cover. And then if you got one that you liked, it was, okay, I'm gonna buy all the bands on the thanks list, right? That's how you did it. Or you would go to show and listen to someone talk about bands, and that's kind of how it worked. Or the random, because living in Miami, you didn't get most of the cool bands. They didn't tour down there. Definitely not the small punk bands, for sure. It was far, and no one cared. Like, you would get the big punk bands, which was rad. So, like, you know, I got to see the biggest stuff, Seven Seconds, Ramones, you know, shit like that. But, like, the small punk bands, fuck no. They didn't come down there. Or not, not in the way that it would if I lived in like Atlanta or Chicago or something like that or New York or whatever, wherever. But it's just cause Miami, Miami, Florida itself is fucking inconvenient. And then think about Miami. It's like, Holy fuck. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's six hours South of Gainesville and Gainesville's fucking far. It's a tough sell unless you're, you know, unless you play, you know, New York style hardcore. And then in the late eighties, early nineties, you were wildly popular in Miami or you were just an enormous band. I mean, the Ramones were enormous, right? Shit like that. But that's it. So one thing that triggered, are you, and this is just like a small little tip that I want to add. Did you go to school for writing? No, fuck no. Oh, because it sounds like you're, that's like you're, because you said you wrote, did a lot of writing for Fest and, and back then. So, um, I, and then you're talking about like, like mythos and myths of like stuff. And then you're talking about being overseas and they're asking about Gainesville. Like so it's like, it seems like th that for some reason, I thought of writing and being the world that you're, what you're, you were you yeah. to go for. No, I mean, I love writing, but I uh, know I did not go to school for writing whatsoever. Oh, okay. Um, but I, but I love storytelling. I mean, ah, I always there we go. have, yeah. you know, so I, I've always had a, an inclination for it too. And again, that's what I loved about the punk underworld when I was 13. Oh, it's so, it was such a mystery. But, but, and, but just listening to people talk about it, it seemed like, you know, the stuff of legend, you know, like when I, my first show going to my first show, I thought it was, I thought the bands were like fucking superheroes seeing UK subs and Ultraman. I was like, who are these people? This is fucking incredible. And I'm sure if I saw a video of that show, I'd be like, Oh, <laughs> but, but the impact on 14 year old me was 
incredible. I had seen some like, you know, local junior high like bands, but when I saw my first touring band, I was like, holy fuck. And then standing outside, just listening to people talk about it. I was just, that was it. I was in, I mean, I'm just like, fuck, I'm finding yesterday and today I'm going to the, we're getting, we're making magic. I had a record player uh, and I just jumped in both feet and it was, I loved that you had to fight for everything. I loved that half the time you were wrong. You'd save your money and you'd have enough money to buy two records and you would buy one and you'd be like, oh, this thing sucks. And you're like, God damn it. But I liked that. It was detrimental to my record collection, but I really, and I missed out on stuff because I chose wrong. I can remember lots of being in the record store as a, as a young person and flipping and, and some covers crystallize in my head and I'm like, oh, I can't buy that. I gotta buy this. And I'm like, God damn it. And now, of course, as a collector, I kick myself a little bit, but what are you going to do? You know, I feel like things come to you for a reason and, and whatever. But I, I love that style and that's ultimately, you know, what kept me so interested and, in, you know, and I love, I so, I want to give back to anyone that's interested that I'm coming to orbit. I was so lucky to experience music and the punk culture in the way that I did. I want to make sure that everyone else has the same opportunity. You know, I've always thought that if people had seen the world through my eyes, they would be the same person as me. And I want to try to, and I like, I'm so appreciative of all the things that I've gotten a chance to see or be a part of. And so I, I want to try to, pass that on as much as I can. Was that like one of the things that got you, let you brought to the table when you joined the band? Uh, I don't, yeah, yes, yes. I will say this. I am a fucking long winded fucker. Like, and I, I didn't, you know, it's so funny. I have zero like stage fright or anything like that. I could speak in front of one person or 10,000. It doesn't matter to me. It's all the same. I didn't realize that that was like an attribute. Um, so, yes, I will say that the band changed when I joined in that sense of when somebody broke a string, it wasn't as fucking awkward. You know what I mean? I'll say that. <laughs> well, no, I meant I meant the fact that your drive for, you know, this whole thing's about the scene this is like the late 90s scene, which is different from the earlier scene. But it's still like w this is what I loved. And but when you go into the band, you know, you can maybe at the time when you're however old, you're not, you know, you're out of college, you're not thinking like, I'm, I have a mission statement to bring this, but like, you're going in like, this is so cool. I'm going to be in this band. And then when we travel, like I get to fucking talk to people about this shit, or I get to learn about this shit, or I can keep this thing going with what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a very like hindsighty approach 100%. and it totally makes sense. I had zero impetus in the moment of that. It's funny when I joined the band. So to go back to that time, so John, John and Travis started the band. Uh, John is the drummer and Travis is the singer. Um, they were, so John's from New York, uh, upstate originally, and Travis is from St. Augustine. Um, and we actually are all the same age, which is kind of awesome. So Travis moved to Gainesville in like 93 and was really into fast punk. Like there wasn't, I mean, Gainesville, especially at that era was way more melodic punk. It was Husker Du, Naked Ray Gun, pop punk, sing along, that type of stuff. Really look out heavy. Jawbreaker were like cult heroes here. Uh, maybe before a, a lot of other places, mostly because they would come here, <laughs> you know, and stay for like week on end. And, and so everybody was friends with them. Same with anything from the Bay, right, was big here. All of that shit. Sam I Am, Green Day, Jawbreaker, because all those bands would stay here for, I mean, there is a Bay Area connection we can get into way more if you ever wanted to. But, you know, just stemming all the way back to the back cover of the Op Ivy LP is taken from a No Idea magazine, right? It's a picture from Gainesville. There's always been this connection with the two places to a certain extent, right? Obviously, I did not know that. I, this is the first time I've heard that. Oh, man, I got so much weird punk trivia if you ever want to go down that road. But again, that's way different than like talking about Asshole Parade. But so I knew Travis from going to shows and, there, you know, I was from Miami and I, in Miami, 
hardcore was metal was more and more popular. You know, there was no metal scene in Gainesville, at least back then. Not really. There was a band called Grinch that was cool, but they were like more typical metal. Like I, I wasn't wasn't the metal I like. One of the advantages to growing up in Florida in the late 80s, early 90s was like just killer death metal everywhere. I mean, that was my sister's. My, this is going to sound fucking stupid, but my sister's boyfriend's roommate was Sean Reinhardt from Cynic. So I got exposed to a lot of death metal, 87, 88, 89, 90, right? And all seeing all the, all those bands come to Miami all the time. So I was into aggressive music, right? Because that's what was going on. And then the New York hardcore thing got really popular in Miami. So a lot of Gnostic Fronts, when Sick of It All started touring, right? And that DRI, and that was kind of the shit I was into. And then one of the last shows I saw in Miami was Rorschach and Born Against. And, and that was more the direction I wanted to go because it was less of the pomp of death metal. Plus, I couldn't ever play that well. <laughs> I had started playing in bands by then. and. I could never shred on the death metal level. I just was never going to put in the time. And whatever you think of it, death metal, those people are so fucking talented. Yeah, and you also think, too, that they're just fucking, you know, because if you get on stage, again, I want to get into this about you guys, too. It's like when you see an aggressive band, you are kind of, like, I used to like going to shows and being afraid of the band coming on. And then you you talk to them, you're like, these are, like, the nicest people. (laughs) A lot of death metal bands are like that, too, but they look bananas, right? But I just... Anyway, the point of the story was that I liked that kind of music. And so Travis and I always got along really well because of that. Because, you know, you gravitate towards people and we would talk. And I was doing shows at my house by the time he moved here. And I would always book the more aggressive bands, right? Whereas like the more pop punk bands would play with the classic Gainesville bands of that era, right? Spoke, Radon, Bombshell, Paste Eater, that shit, you know, and I would go more for the more aggressive shit and find weirdos to play in, or do like fucking spoken word or dumb shit like that. Cause I would do anything to fill a show. And so we were friends from the get. And when they started the band, so John living in upstate New York and he was playing in a pop punk band called stress boy or like punk band. And they played a couple shows with this band called van Bilderas. That's from Gainesville. And they had been on tour. And John at that point was just dying to get out of upstate. He just, you know, you get you, you different moments of your life just need to change that kind of thing. And he really liked the the people in Van Bilderhuis, and they were they are, were always looking for a drummer, basically. And so he was like, "Fuck it!" And so he moved to Gainesville to play drums for Van Bilderhuis, and that was in '94. That's kind of they met Travis and and John met and it was like pretty instantaneous, right? Uh, and they they started the band. They got two other guys to start the band. Brian Johnson, who was the first guitar player. He had been in a punk band called Ass Backwards and a bunch of other bands too, but but also liked, you know, DRI and MDC, that kind of side of, of punk music. And then, interestingly enough, they got Chris Campisi, who was the first bass player in Asshole Parade, and, and he also liked classic punk. He's a little bit different from the rest of the guys, but a fucking absolute ripper. So that was, I think, really helped them initially. So if you listen to those first like demos, some of the bass playing is bananas because Chris is uh, really talented, always has been. And the thing that helped too is that Chris was very much in the scene. He was part of the scene in a way that those other guys were not. He was kind of in with the – like he lived on and off at the Spoke House. He was in with the Radon guys. He was, you know, he was in Less Than Jake initially. He was just kind of in the mix way more. That was kind of a lot of connections initially, but then when they when they started playing shows, it was like, holy shit, this band is way different, right? And like, you know, the power violence thing hadn't really landed in Gainesville, obviously, because I mean, talking ninety five, end of ninety four, ninety five, and while it was always happening, right? Like, you just there are no, no bands touring, and so that's usually where the big explosions come from band comes through and all of a sudden everybody sounds like band because everybody bought band's record you know 
and that wasn't happening. And so it was, they were, you know, a lot of it kind of organically was happening around then, you know, that was, so the, all the slap of ham stuff was really going. And then kind of at the same time, there was all that gravity shit starting to, and like real or really taking off, I should say. What was that? Wait, what was gravity? What the gravity shit? Gravity records. You were into any of that shit, like heroin, UOA, Antioch Arrow, all okay. that shit. Yeah, Swing yeah. kids, like. So there was those two kind of, kind of schools really drove the hardcore scene here. So you know, Asshole Parade was more on the kind of power violency side of things. You know, crossed out and you know, in, obviously infest and just shit like that. You know, that no comment, like kind of the classic power violence stuff and the more the gravity stuff was more like the palaka scene or, or you know stuff like that but definitely kind of bedfellows in that sense but all that kind of started at the same time and i was playing in a hardcore band at the time that was a little bit different and we we had been like super active right and and been touring a bunch that was the band that i met tony on tour with and and whatnot and just kind of a we played with that ap a bunch when they first started we were on the way out they were on the way starting and since we were uh, a heavier band there made more sense for them to play with someone like us than like a spoke or radon or spoke was gone by then but you know what i mean not that it's not awesome to play mixed shows it just didn't happen as much right and so yeah, I mean, it was it was awesome. So I was always a fan of the band, you know, kind of watching them from the get. They just took off kind of quick, you know, it was awesome. They swapped members, you know, so Chris dropped out because he moved to California pretty quick. They had started, like, they, their second show was awesome. They, they played with Dystopia in Savannah. That was rad. And that's where they met, like, in Humanity and, and the Damned people. And so that all kind of started all at the same time they were bringing the bands to florida because a lot of those bands wanted to come down here they just didn't know who to talk to and so i would do the shows first at my house and then i bought the venue in town that had been doing shows forever it was called the hardback and i bought the hardback you bought the hardback yeah it's a long story but wait did you hot- did, did you put the show on the hot water music like famous yeah. left oh, get yeah, the yeah. fuck out of here oh uh-huh. my god it's amazing yeah so i bought the hardback and ex- funny so i i well we took it over we bought it but we took it over whatever that's a different story but i did it with my one of my really close friends we took over so we were doing a lot of the shows so in 97 let me get timing right yes december of 96 Asshole Parade had already done like a big tour, U.S. tour, and they had made a bunch of friends and they had got on Fiesta Grande, which was this big power violence festival at Gilman that Chris Dodge would do every year. If you like power violence, if you like that kind of music, it was the pinnacle. I mean, really, it was they did it, I think, eight years. It was, I mean, breathtaking. I mean, the first one was the first time Asuk went to California. That was, they started it then, and then they just kept doing it every year in January, and it was two days, and it was like, kind of the first time Japanese bands came to play in the States was for Fiesta Grande. It just it became this huge thing, and if you're into that genre, that's the, was incredible. The guys in AP really wanted, that at that point, they were still a four-piece, right? So Chris had, uh, moved to California and Travis Johnson, who had gone to high school with Travis Ginn, he joined on bass. He had been in this and so on, which was another band of the same kind of ilk. And so he joined on bass, Asshole Parade. They were a four piece, but they were nervous that they needed a bigger sound because Gilman is pretty big and it's a big fucking festival. It's like a huge deal. It's like the who's who. And so they wanted to be as best they could they fucking came the guys came to the hardback and me and my buddy were obviously working and they were they they sat down and one thing that's awesome to note about travis the singer of asshole parade he the whole time we worked at the hardback he never missed a night that he was in town he was there every night to the point where we had his own stool at the bar it was fucking awesome he never like worked there but he kind of did he was like the guy and in, in he would come for every night, every night. Didn't matter what we were doing. They, so they came up there and they're just like, man, we need a 
we need a guitar player. And I was like, awesome. That sounds awesome. I was a huge fan and so was Drew. And, and so we basically flipped a coin and Drew joined and went to Fiesta Grande and then did stayed in the band for about eight months and then was like, ah, I want to do something different. So he quit and then I took over. So that's kind of how it happened. I joined technically, I guess, the fall of 97 and then through that era or no, maybe I'm switching it. Maybe fall of 98, fall of 98. That's what it was. So the Fiesta Grande, so spin everything forward a year. So the Fiesta Grande was January of 98. I get my dates messed up. And then he did the tour. Drew did the, he did Fiesta Grande, came back and then did the summer tour in 98 with AP. And then he quit in September and I joined in September, played a couple shows in the fall. And then we did the, the last hardback show, January 99. And then the AP Europe tour happened that spring. How did you balance all this shit with owning the, well, I guess when the club uh, closes, then you're free to do whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just did it. I don't know. I mean, it's crazy when I think about it now. I didn't think about it then. I think that's how we did it. I mean, imagine being 22 years old and you buy your most favorite club in the world. Like, that's I did it. It was kind of crazy because sometimes you make choices that you don't really know why. So when I look back now, it seems like, oh, this was so, what a vision or some bullshit like that. But it wasn't. It just, I just remember, so we bought the bar and I had, I was working for VAR at that point, working at No Idea. Drew, who was my partner, he's the, I, we did a band together called Strike Force Diablo. I think Drew from Ashtray connected us. Is that right? Um, yes. I think he gave me your info. Yes, the only, I met I met Drew because I met Drew Williams from Ashtray because he really liked, he likes Drew DeMaio. He likes all his bands, Strike Force Diablo being one of them. The reason I met Drew Williams is because he just did a record for Strike Force Diablo, which was the band I did with Drew, who I own the hardback with. And that was our kind of band to open all the shows that people didn't have enough bands for. And Drew was the other guy in Asshole Parade that we swapped with. We did a reverse swap where I was in floor and then Drew drawing floor. So there's a lot of that incestuous Florida shit. You are so like, insanely embedded in, in Gainesville. It's, it's insane. Well, you got to realize there's only like 10 of us. It's all because you, you, you know, you talk to, you would get this same kind of iteration from a lot of different people. You know, I don't think it's unique to me. My point with the hardback was I was working at No Idea and Drew was working at this place called Rick's Movie Graphics, which was a poster place, which doesn't make any sense now, but in the 90s it made sense. And I insisted on... Cause, dude, so we bought this bar, and you got to understand, at this point, I'm living on a porch with a roommate. My rent is like 50 bucks a month, and I have no expenses because I work at a record distro, so anything I would buy, I just would get at wholesale. And then I love punk, going to punk shows and drinking, and that's what I did every night like as a job or whatever. But I was insistent that we both keep day jobs so that, that we could – not take any money out of the bar so that we could always pay our employees as much as possible. And any band that came through that had a shitty show, we had this fund where we could pay them a ton of money because we didn't take any money out of it. And I just, I just remember, and Drew was always so bummed because he was like, why can't I quit my job? I fucking hate rolling fucking Raiders of Lost Ark posters. It's fucking stupid. And I was like, yeah, but isn't it cool like when the fucking shitty punk band, like I don't want to use names, but they come through and five people come out and we could still give them 200 bucks. He's like, yeah, but it'd be cool to not work. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, but like, just just ride with me, man. And he did it. And I don't know. We still joke. He was just, we. so the whole point of this whole thing was that we just did a couple shows as Strike Force because Drew Williams put out this record and he had asked us to play some shows and we were just chopping it up like two weeks ago again because we played this show and, you know, we don't – that band and that band was a very 90s band as well. And there was a point where we were going to do an Asphalt Parade Strike Force record to bring it a little more full circle because of the embedded nature of Drew and I both being an AP and 
they playing at the hardback and that's when we work whatever we were just chopping it up about some of the that era of our lives and it's like so funny so you just for a side note you you're good until two o'clock right and then you gotta bounce uh well i how about 115 and then if you i do have a job sort of Oh shit! Okay, wow. There's a lot of ground I want to cover in 30 minutes. Okay, um, we can do it again if you want. I'm su- I'm super prone to digression. Uh, I I will say I have no vanity, so just tell me to shut up when you need me to stay on target. No, it's like I mean, really, want to just what I want to break down is just the the band itself. On I mean, the one thing that I think about with the band is the. I mean, it's like you said, ass suck. Every time I keep remembering this interview is coming up, I'm like, ass suck. I'm like, no, it's asshole parade. And <laughs> and I just remember like when I'm watching, like I'm listening to the Spotify songs and all stuff, like you guys are an aggressive band. And this question is just so such a break from everything you're talking about. But like, was the name of the band, like the, the idea of the band, was it just to play shows and not get really popular? And one of the reasons why they named the band so aggressively was to be like, this will actually keep us from getting as big as we could possibly get. No, I think that's one of those hindsight things. I mean, you'd have to ask John. John came up with the name. The name is fucking awesome, first off. I've always been a huge fan. And I don't think there was... Nobody had aspirations like that. Nobody thought in that context that I remember ever. Because even Asuk, who was the biggest band like that in our universe, I mean, still to this day... They they were funny because they were courted constantly by larger crowds and they would have to reject all of this stuff to maintain everything they did was on purpose. They could have been 50 times the size that they were, even though they were fucking massive in our world. They were massive. Right. Like I I don't in the relative scheme of things, I, I you know, they're not bigger than fucking pick whatever band it's not like they're clutch or something like that but in our world they were the fucking apex predator and the thing that's interesting about them is that they had this same kind of obsession with diy before that was such a thing they came from tampa and and have roots in the death metal scene i mean fucking proctor you know he is of that ilk the drummer he's of those bands and they just were like, nope, $5 shows, we're going to play with the lights on, we're going to be awkward as fuck. Everything about them was so obstinate, and we loved everyone in the punk scene loved that because it was – they rejected the – when you think about the term of sellout, when people use that word, it's, it's, it's easily tossed around, but it only matters if you have the chance or not. One of the things that's so endearing about a band like Fugazi is that they had the chance. They had many chances. Think about all the ways they could have cashed in to the point where it's even lampooned by comedians now. I don't know if you've ever heard Todd Berry. He's like a pretty prominent comedian. But he has like this fucking awesome Fugazi riff. But it's hilarious that their choices are so like profound that it's kind of leaked into culture, right? The $5 show. Uh, all that stuff, like not giving in when the when punk broke in the early 90s and going major and all this stuff. And Asuk was our version of that. Uh, I was great friends with the guys in the band and, and did a lot of shows for them and always was like a huge fan. And, and Asuk Parade definitely coveted them and, and, and their contributions to Florida. And I don't think there was ever like a, hey, we're going to get as big as Asuk. That would have been the the furthest reach you could have gone, even potentially. And that was like, no one could ever be that big in our mind. And that big by like, oh, 300 people come to see you play, which in modern context, that means nothing. But then that was like fucking the unimaginable. I, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak for John on the name. I think he just liked it. it fucking in the same vein of like, you know what's hostile is fucking Dead Kennedys. That name is fucking hostile as fuck. You, what name is hostile? Sex Pistols. That name is hostile, right? And Naked Ray Gun, right? That's a riff off uh, Sex Pistols, right? So I think it's more in that vein. Like, yeah, I'm going to thumb my nose at you. I think it's more of that than 
I don't want to be famous. But at the same time, it's like in, there's a hidden thing there, too, where you're kind of like, this is going to keep us in line with what we're trying to do, almost. I guess. I don't. Yeah. Sure. And again, this is like, it's theorizing, and I sometimes just go in this direction. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it gives it too much credit. You know what I mean? I think it was more But like, I think subconsciously, it's like that little thing that's there. Maybe. Maybe. Sure. And I don't know. I mean, if I think it was more like, dude asshole for it but yeah dude <laughs> yeah, i think yeah. that's way more of it because there was a lot again very drug culture when the band first started and just a lot of that kind of wild kind of you know so one of the things that's interesting about the band is that while asuk was the pinnacle they and and the standard bearer for this kind of stuff they weren't fun you know you you didn't want to hang out with asuk right that goes nowhere no i mean they're sweet people amazing but they they're all straight edge and they're kind of sticks in the mud and like okay. asshole parade is like that's a fucking good time like <laughs> not to, like like before i joined the band it was a good time and i still think when we play people still come out because it's fucking good time like when we play before we play after we play like that's still a huge component of the band we make everything so weird that you can't disarm yourself and just go bananas. One of the things that came, we because we played some shows this summer, one of the things that is always fun when we get back to doing stuff is that we've had a lot of members over the years, right? You know, we've had a lot of lineup changes and most of that's just people move or age, you know, get into different shit or whatever. But there's kind of this unspoken thing with the band is that Nobody can join the band if everyone that's ever been in the band didn't approve. It's not like we ask permission, but that's definitely the standard. And I think like you got to be fun. It's got you got to have that wild. There has to be some wild component to you. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Well, that, that's leading to my other question. And this is going to the place. But like, what did you like better? Did you like playing a show as an aggressive band or did you like seeing bands Play. Oh, playing. Oh, my God. I mean, I loved watching bands. Oh, fucking. I've had a chance to see so many fucking incredible bands, but there's nothing like playing and just like getting into in, And like one thing that's so cool about being in, the, in a band like that is that you kind of, especially when we would go on tour, you would just we were kind of a band where we kind of have, we, like, we write a set list and like play it for a week, you know, and then switch it around or whatever. Because our songs are kind of, they're very short. And so our set is only 20 minutes. There's not a lot of time to dick around and be like, hey, what about this one? You know, that doesn't make for a fun show. So we try to be as like assaulting and efficient as possible. So in order to do that, you kind of have to map things out, right? Like, hey, this one ends like this. Can we go in? That's what most of the practice is before a tour because we arrange everything. It's, you know, you put work into it. But one thing that's amazing is like, you know, oh, dude, this next block's going to fucking slam. And you just, you know it. And, it. and when you see the crowd, you know what kind of crowd it's going to be. You know, you kind of get the vibe for what parts of the set they're going to be more into. I fucking love that shit. It's fucking best. It still keeps me there. Like, we just played two months ago, and it's just as fun now as it was in the 90s. Like, to me. Well, did you guys hit any, between you joining the band in 98 and them already starting in 95. So up until currently, like at what point in that giant timeline did you feel that it was kind of working against you? Like the scene was working against you playing or did that not happen? Uh, working against us? Like where um, you were like, fuck man, these shows are starting to suck because these bands around us are like so opposite uh, of what we are. Right. No, I will say this. Asshole Parade, especially since I've been in the band and really from Get. The shows have always been good, and I fucking do not know why. I'll be the first one to admit I'm always surprised when anyone gives a shit. Even, like, now when we're, we're older, you know, so I'm 48 years old, and I'm, like, a little, not self-conscious, but just a little bit mystified because we just played, you know, these shows this summer, and ain't nobody in the crowd, like, my, like, close friend, like that, like, a couple, but the crowds are much bigger, and so you know, 99.9% .9 of people I don't know anymore. And so it's kind of like, because when you first start, it's your friends that come to see you. Now it's not like that, which is as rewarding in a different way. But the shows have always been good. The hardest part for us is just dealing with each other. <laughs> I mean, like, 
And not that we don't love each other, but there's just lots of stop and start and what level of investment do we want to put into this? And especially when you've been a band as long as we have, we don't, there's no aspirations anymore. We just do it because it's fun. And, and honestly, we need like inspiration from time to time. We have a, we wrote a new record and we're just, we haven't finished it recording because we're just so all over the place. And you guys have that demo 2020. Right. So that, and so that, that's, that's a portion of the record. We recorded a whole record. So you put up half of it, even though you're like, fuck, it's we got to get the out there. It's less than half. It's oh, just, wow. it's, so the reason we did that demo was again, that was before COVID. And so we, we went to Japan um, years ago and it was fucking amazing. And we kind of reconnected with some bands and cause that, that Fiesta Grande that I was talking to you about earlier, Slight Slappers played that Fiesta Grande. They're a Japanese thrash band, similar to Asshole Parade. We had always wanted to go to Japan and tour with them. And so we did that split record with them. We went to Japan and it was fucking amazing. The tour was incredible. And we just made some really dear friends and we really wanted to reconnect. And so in summer of 2020, there's been since Fiesta Grande stopped, there was Super Sabato, which was another iteration done by different people, similar vibe. And then now there's this Zeta Fest, which is, again, different people, but similar vibe, all in San Francisco. The Zeta Fest in 2020 was supposed to be Fuck on the Beach and Slight Slappers and the guy that – this guy Shiggy, who was our – a translator roadie like tour liaison guy that lived in san francisco in the 90s all these people were coming for the fest so we we're like fuck we're doing it the guy had offered us and we we're like fuck yeah so we're gonna go over there and we're gonna do like five shows with fuck on the beach and so we had had all these songs like forever and so finally we we're like fuck we'll, we'll. even then it, it, you couldn't get records out fast and so we couldn't get a record out for July, which is when the fest was supposed to be. So we just recorded and did a demo tape to take on that trip. That's what it was. And you brought an actual tape. Yeah, we made tapes, <laughs> cassette demo tapes. I mean, we're old. We got to remember. So <laughs> we uh, we I think we've sold through four different versions of it, but we made demo tapes. But that didn't happen because COVID and everybody. So everything got canceled. We haven't done anything really since then to finish the record we're only going to finish it if we do something we're not like independently motivated even though we should be but when we finally get our shit together to go on tour do something that's i think when we'll finish the record and it'll come out but that's a taste of what we're doing now I was going to say, because you guys have a lot of releases on Discogs. I'm wondering how you guys like did all that, or did you just have all that momentum in the early, like late 90s, early 2000s, and then you're like, eh, okay, we're fucking over that. I mean, you know, when a band first starts, it's like an explosion, right? And then uh, we could be, we could have put out like 15 albums by now, but I don't know if the world needs that. I don't, it just kind of, everything happens so organically. I feel like this is the way the band is supposed to operate, especially at this point. I can't believe that anyone still cares, to be honest. I mean, we're so kind of out of time with with where the band started. And it's kind of amazing that people still connect with it. And, you know, the band has always been a great live band. And, you know, from speaking from a fan perspective initially, and then still now, I feel like even in our worst it's still fucking crazy and kind of intoxicating, even if you don't like that kind of music. If you go back to the 90s, one of the things about Ass Suck that was so fucking amazing was they kind of had the Fugazi effect. There'd be like 300 people at an Ass Suck show and at least 150 of them had never heard of them. But they, the name is like, oh, dude, gotta go to the Ass Suck show. And then like the size of a show pulls people. So when you would go see Fugazi, there'd be at least like 400 people there that just saw a crowd or heard this was the thing to do. They never heard of the band. Like in Florida, which is probably a smaller pull for them, they're still playing like 2,000 seat venues, you know? And so you get this kind of like mass effect. And so that's the way ASUC was for sure. And I think AP's got a little bit of that now too, where it's just like, oh, dude, you gotta go to the ASUC picture. That's the way it was. Like the two shows we did this summer were fucking bananas. Like, and there's, and again, we played with, some friends who it was like their first two shows, which is the whole reason we played. 
and they were awesome and they are in other bands that are are pretty popular but i mean it's their no one had ever heard of them i mean it's their first show they wanted us to play it as the you know one of the draws and to kind of anchor the shows and it was off uh, both shows were fucking ape shit it was awesome i could it was are you yeah. ever nervous like when you guys are doing a show currently well not not nervous playing but are you nervous that one of the people because it sounds like you guys are hard to get together when a show is booked are you guys concrete in even though you said in fest you would like bail no no <laughs> so like, like leading up to the show are you like fuck yes. someone's gonna well bail? like like leading up to the show in gainesville <laughs> we couldn't find our bass player like <laughs> that night like dude where the fuck is ed he lost his phone and like missed the whole show and i'm like fuck dude all right and then so we were like uh, all right, I'll just play bass, I guess. Like, we all genuinely had no idea. Was that the one with the Wooly? Yeah. Because mm-hmm. there's a video he, of that on he YouTube. He did show up. He showed up. But, like, uh, up until we played, I had no idea. Okay, because I was saying, because so, it's the still beginning, like that. Yeah, well, in the beginning still... of the video, it's like, you guys, uh, it's like three minutes in, and you guys are still warming up. I'm like, what the fuck are they doing? Like, they, <laughs> they're playing the show. Like, if I was watching, Again, it's... if I was in the crowd, I'd be like, Jesus Christ, get to it. Yeah, but that's that's all part of it. It, it. Like the band is like utterly confusing, overwhelming, makes no sense, but the best thing ever. It's kind of all of those things at the same time. Um, yeah, it's like I mean, for me personally, growing up, if I saw a band with an aggressive name, I'd be more afraid to go because I'm like, I feel like I'm gonna get my ass kicked at this show. Yeah, I mean, the shows were violent too. I mean, they were. We and we we. I'm not saying we would encourage that, but you know that i mean if obviously if shit got weird we would stop but the nature of our band it's 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 fast and everything's strung together we only play we play usually 25 songs 20 minutes you know so there's not a lot of bullshit but did you find people were telling you they were like hey i was actually kind of nervous to come here but i'm so glad that i did or they're like my god i'm fucking afraid maybe i don't remember that so much but i mean i would I could definitely, we've played shows where I, if I wasn't in the band, I'd be like, oh, this is fuck weird. <laughs> you know, like we've done a lot of that, like a lot of like, what is, is this really a place a band would play? Cause we're not a kind of band that plays like clubs or for the most part, usually it's like, I don't know, man, you just stay on this pallet. And it's like, oh, this would be awesome. Do they know we're about to play? It's usually that stuff. Or you're in a house that maybe 10 people can fit into and a hundred people show up. And it's like, all right, you guys cool with the windows getting busted? Like, there's a lot of that. So to that point, and usually I'll leave this. So I figure we covered enough where I can go in this direction and start wrapping this up. Um, so I usually end with two questions. But this one I started asking recently. I think it, this is a perfect time to ask this. Is there a story that you've never told before in an interview that you want to tell now? About asshole parade? Yeah, but like some crazy thing or something funny or something great where you're like, this is just... Dude, I mean, there's like a, a billion. I can imagine. Like, I can't even... I'm trying to think of something you would... Like, is there... A, this is obviously... You didn't ask with this intent. I'm trying to catalog. I will say the band is... So much weird shit happens with the band that is unintentional just because of the nature of the band. I mean... There is the fucking weirdest stuff that goes on and it makes no sense when you, unless you have the full context. I can imagine you guys are a magnet for shit. Oh my God. The fucking weird. I mean, (laughs) the first thing that popped in my head was this. (laughs) I mean, and, and the best part is, is that you could ask anyone in the band and they would have a different iteration. It's just funny to me. We were in Japan and it was our first night there and we were playing a fucking, no, it was our second show in Tokyo. We're playing at Earth Dome, which is like this, to to me, this legendary venue. And we're playing with all these incredible bands. And I'm like, I mean, just, I'm a huge fan of the scene there. And so just so in awe of being there and just kind of getting to be a part of it. And the fact that people there knew the band was like, and we're into the band. It was like so amazing. And so we're there. And one of the things about Asshole Parade, I don't know if you uh, have been a fan of the band or, or at least seen a lot of the, or listened to the music. A lot of the early stuff, especially is very drug laden, right? Um, it's just a big part of the band. 
the first the the seven inch there's all those friday quotes and shit and then you know the the la hive record and so drugs in general has always been kind of a part of the the band's mystique so many times i mean almost every show somebody like wants to get high with us or buy us drinks or get us fucked up because that's what they associate with the band that's still pervasive to this day i remember being in japan and, and in japan a couple of things to to note if you've never been there at least in the scene we were in i mean i, I could do a whole fucking three hours on the japanese scene at least what we were exposed to but a couple of things of note all the venues are really fucking small because all of real estate in japan is is high prior commodity they're not really big venues especially that punk bands are playing and the other thing is that all of the <laughs> they're all fucking small so earth dome is like the ceiling is like seven feet so you just feel like you're in a shoebox the other thing is that everyone in japan smokes cigarettes everyone at least in the punk scene and it's like offensive to smoke outside so you only smoke inside everyone has these personal ashtrays that they carry around with them so there's no like litter that doesn't really happen there which is why you don't smoke outside because the chance of you dropping your cigarette butt is higher it's like a fucking intense place but so you're in this little fucking shoebox it's sold out it's fucking bananas and sold out obviously a misnomer because it's small but it's incredible lineup right we're playing a burning spirit show which if you're into japanese hardcore is like I can't even imagine 18 year old me would not believe that I was on a burning spirit show, you know? And so this is like fucking magical. And I'm sitting there and like, there's just this fucking unending cloud of smoke, which I'm okay with, but it's, it's even as a smoker, it's intimidating. You're like, fuck, this is insane. <laughs> and I had, uh, when I got into my thirties, I stopped smoking weed. It just, it wasn't working for me anymore. It made me hear the phone ring. Like when I, like before cell phones, I would get high and just constantly hear a phone ringing and just, I don't know. I liked other drugs okay. and still do. It just kind of went in a different direction. And so I'm in Japan and I'm just squinting and I'm backstage and there's not a ton of English, right? And my Japanese is non-existent. So it was kind of a little bit of struggle, but I'm super wide eyed. I, I, I like want to get pictures with everyone kind of, and it's kind of, kind of a nerd. And I'm like back in the band area and our, our guy, like our tour contact guy comes up and he's like, Hey, this guy wants to smoke weed with you, which is a very common ask if you are around asshole parade. And I'm like, yeah, I don't, you got any other drugs? I'm not really like weed guy anymore. And one thing to note about Japan is that weed is on the same level as like heroin is here. It's like, like a ultra felony to have marijuana. So to be offered weed in public is like a, a big fucking deal. I'll just put it. That's the way it was explained to me. So, so then I'm like, Oh, okay. And then it's like this like pseudo gangster guy and his like crew who's like wanting to like smoke weed with asshole parade. And I was like, and I was the only one there. So it's like, I, it's one of those, like you can't say no things. And I'm like, all right, dude, let's do it. And so I'm puffing on this joint and it's fucking strong. And then I'm just like high as fuck, out of practice being high as fuck. I'm like over the moon with euphoria, just being a part of the show. And I'm walking around and I can't see anything because it's so fucking smoky. And then I just keep hearing the phone ring. And so I'm constantly like lifting like a beer bottle. Like just everyone in the band is making fun of me because they know what happens. And then I'm like trying to like drink enough to like kind of get more in line with myself because I'm also fucking over the moon to play in this legendary venue. And you hadn't played yet. You had not played. No, yet. no, no. We oh, hadn't played shit. Yet. It's so like, I'm like, fuck. And then the other thing to note about Japan, <laughs> so none of the bands have equipment. Like all of the venues provide the gear. And so they call them live houses there. I, most of the bands only have one guitar player. Every live house has the same setup. They have this, they have a, a kind of a half stack, right? It's either Marshall or I don't know if you're into gear. Yeah. It's either Marshall or Laney, right? Which is kind of a weird offshoot from the 90s right and that's usually the the half stack you would see 
You know, this would be like a JCM 900 or, or 2000 or some bullshit. Or a piece of shit Laney. Yeah, yeah. And, or, or like a, you know, really low-end uh, Mesa Boogie, something like that. But, but something that you could get crunchy with, right? But then on the other side is a fucking rolling jazz chorus, which is a, it's a little combo amp that's fucking clean as fuck. Didn't bring a distortion pedal, you know, just, all right, we're going to sound like ska band, fuck it. Like, <laughs> and so there's two guitar players and asshole paraded. So Tony and I would switch. All right. Cause this was our second show. And, and the guy kind of explained to us, this was going to be the setup every night. And we're too stupid to like realize, Hey, we're in like the third largest city in the world. They probably have a fucking effects place where we could buy a distortion pedal. That never occurred to us because we're fucking stupid. And so every night one of us would sound like we're in a fucking ska band, upstroke style, clean. If you can imagine like clean fucking power violence, that that happens. <laughs> and so, of course, it was my night to play through the clean amp. There's no like ring out or feedback or <laughs> And they're like meticulous with sound right there because the venues are small and the fucking sound systems are incredible. And so you hear everything. So I'm still high as fuck when we play. I'm so fucking nervous and I can hear myself just upstroking. And every time I look over, Tony's just staring at me, like holding out this feedback and looking at me like, yeah, motherfucker, you ain't got none of this. I'm just <laughs> like, God damn it. This is the greatest and worst moment of my life. Like fucking apex mountain. Like this is it. So I, that was the first thing that popped in my head, but there's a billion stories like that, that I don't know if it's worth, going through or, or, or not, but that's the first thing that popped in my head. I feel like you just need your own podcast to talk <laughs> about all the shit that you know about Florida and then just random asshole parade stories. There's a lot more than asshole parade stories, but yes, I have a lot of stories. <laughs> I, d- I tend to retain like the weirdest shit. Uh, I can definitely attest to that. Well, I, I am going to end with two questions, but do you have one more story that you want to tell? Because I know you have a billion. Uh, uh, asshole parade story? Yeah. Dude, there's so many. I'm trying to think of like stuff that you would want to to know, or just that would be that would be funny. Here's a short one. This is this is kind of funny. So, and it, it kind of harkens back to a different era, right? So, uh, when we went to Europe the in the first time, uh, so it's the summer of '99. There was email. Right. Obviously, that's the way we we connected. So this guy, Nick, that did Enslaved Records, he's the one that booked our tour. He was in that band boxed in. I don't know what you're into. But anyway, uh, we had been talking to him about the tour, emailing and we fucking did postcards and shit back then. But he had no idea what we looked like because all the pictures on the records are like kind of blurry and whatever. And he didn't know what we looked like. And so uh, (laughs) there was a a moment in my life where I thought at the hardback, I made everyone that worked there wear Hawaiian shirts just because I thought it was fucking funny because we had like a huge uh, skinhead population that would frequent the, the bar all the time. And we, we had a lot of you know, chaos punks and we had just a lot of normies. And I just, I don't know. I thought it would be funny instead of just looking like a generic Gainesville person with like fucking jeans and some band shirt from the 80s to make everyone wear Hawaiian shirts. And so we did that a lot. And so the guys in AP kind of were kind of into that too. So when we got on the plane to fly over to T to the to and we've landed in amsterdam and to start the tour <laughs> we we didn't know what nick looked like either right and so we're all in fucking hawaiian shirts and i had freshly shaved my head because i'm like dude we're being on a tour for three months fuck it i'm just gonna go no guard like whatever and but everybody else just you know whatever we just look like normal people you know, tattoos and whatever, but like, I don't know, white, typical white dudes in their 20s. The guy was like, so Nick and his girlfriend um, that were doing the tour, we walked past them like 500 times. We had no idea where to go. We're like walking in circles, like, what the fuck? Like, thankfully, we didn't have a show the first night. We sat outside for like three hours, and he was like, convinced that we would have like dreadlocks or like giant mohawks or i don't know just look way more punk 
then the fact that we all wearing Hawaiian shirts, it was like, he finally, his girlfriend, because finally he's like, okay, what are these five dudes? They're not on a rugby team. They look <laughs> way too out of shape. Like what the fuck are these people? And she finally was like, you're not in a band. And we're like, dude, fuck yes. You're cause she had dreadlocks. And we finally, and Nick was, I, Nick came, I'm like, dude, I've walked past you like a hundred times. He was like, I know I seen you, but I just, there's no way you're asshole free. I'm like, dude, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny. And then it was, so the first, the first fucking show, this goes to the band. So the very first fucking show, he's like, man, you guys look so normal. I don't, I don't understand. I just thought you guys would be way more fucking, I don't know, road warrior, savage looking some shit, you know, like postcard punk, whatever. I don't know. And I, was, I, I remember talking to him like, I don't know, man, this is just the, this is the look, vibe, I, whatever. But the first night we fucking raged. We, everyone in the, we played in this squat in, um, in, in, in France or, or Belgium, Belgium. And we fucking outlasted raid. Everyone passed out. We drank all the booze, did all the drugs to the point where we're trying to wake everybody up at five in the morning. Like, dude, I thought you were fucking hardcore. What the fuck? This is. And at that point, Nick was like, dude, three months of this. I don't know if I can. Handle this. <laughs> like it was fucking hilarious. Cause he never, we never let him live it down for the whole tour. Like, oh, we're not hardcore enough for you, huh? And like, just <laughs> at any moment, biggest show, giant circle pit, we would stop it. We would stop the show and I would get on the mic and be say shit like, oh, hey, guys, are, are we too normal looking? Nick from Enslaved thinks we're too normal looking. So if you guys want us to stop, we'll stop. And we're just fucking trolling before there was trolling. Like the rest <laughs> of the tour it was fucking, he totally hated us after that. I was like, he's, at the end, he was like, I remember leaving and he was like, yes, you're fine with dreadlocks. <laughs> <laughs> I see, like, I've, if I saw five guys in Hawaiian shirts, I'd be like, I'm not fucking with those guys. Dude, I mean, like, and, like, so, all of us so clueless. Just, like, I mean, uh, it's just hilarious. But, anyway, I don't know. There's tons of stories like that. I don't, there's nasty ones that are, like, weird and there's fun ones. I don't, I don't know. There's all kinds of shit. I mean, like, it is eternal. Yeah, no, I'm sure there's like a fucking a well of stories oh. from you guys. <laughs> I mean, I think any bands really, but like Yeah, there's a lot of stories, especially from back in the nineties. I don't I think there's a lot of stories where people are like, I could tell a story, but I really shouldn't tell it and you're like, I get it. Cause there, I mean, yeah, shit was some some people just had crazy antics and shit on tour back then. Well, and, I think a lot of it too was like, you know, uh, you can't Nothing was documented then. Like now, all this shit would be caught on video because it's so easy to take a video now. A, a lot of it is you're so much more connected to each of the moments, which crazy shit still happens all the time. It just happens in a different way, I think, now. And yeah, I kind of like the fact that, I mean, I think it's better when it's not on, if it's not documented <laughs> and it's like your own thing and it's sure. like a memory and you're like, oh, yeah. yeah I mean, I came up that way, so I, I'm kind of dialed into that but you know and, and not to say that the way things are are now isn't as awesome i mean i would have fucking killed to be able to go on youtube and watch like fucking dead kennedys from the 80 you know that would have been amazing think of all the shitty records i wouldn't have had to buy that would have been fucking amazing so uh, in a lot of ways it's way better now but you know there's trade-offs for it to wrap this up, before I ask the last question, is there something you like to plug? It could be about you. It could be about a friend. It could be about both. I mean, not really. Um, just as far as music goes, I mean, I think just keep supporting where you live. Like check out local bands and, and try to be active. People sometimes glamorize the things that are they can't have and so they opine for things that aren't part of their everyday and they, you know, you take for granted what's around you. You know, maybe your local scene isn't exactly what you want it to be, you know, and there's been a lot of times where the hardcore scene here sucks, but I still go to shows because that's important and and help people be a part of the creative process, I think is I think universal. That's the only way the culture survives and passes down, even in this technologically connected era it still requires that participation and it starts really on that local level you know one of the things i love about 
fest is the fact that kind of reiterates and reinforces that when people come and they give you adoration for, you know, your local scene and, and things that have happened here and things that still happen here, that kind of reinforces that it's that work, it's that investment. You have to be a part of the discussion and you have to be a part of the flow for, for that kind of thing to happen. So that would be the only thing I would say. I mean, as far as music stuff goes, I think that's always been so important and, and especially now when we, I mean, shit, I could see a show listing from, you know, Chicago and be, oh, I want to go to that show. But really, I should be focusing on, you know, hey, what's happening here? I tend to get caught up in that because I have a very specific interest in terms of what I like currently. But, you know, just because I'm not super plugged into what's happening doesn't mean I shouldn't participate, you know, and help make it something I'm more into. And, you know, sometimes you surprise yourself where the, the value you can lie and, and if you're not open to it then you know you never have that chance is there a band a current that this isn't the last question but <clears throat> is there a current band that you are listening to that you want to give like a, a name drop to i mean i listen to music uh, like uh, I, I consume music fucking relentlessly i fucking love i always have uh, new music old music but like a newer band that someone you're like you, someone has to check this band out because they're new and it's fresh and it's like it reminds me of this. Um, I'm just thinking of what's on my record player. Playing on a chain. If you haven't heard them, fuck great. It's a uh, Brian uh, Stern, who's an old friend of the band and an old friend of mine, and a bunch of like kind of people that he's played music with for years. They have a couple seven inches out on Blind Rage. Uh, Brian lives in Oakland. He, they fucking rip. They're great. I haven't got a chance to see them, but I love the singles and a lot of the stuff on Blind Rage. I really like as well. It's a it's a cool label. If you're in, in, they put out stuff that's kind of all over the place, which is kind of cool. Locally, there's been a band here for a couple of years called Pez. Which fucking rips. Their live show is great. Super sweet guys. They played the show with us this summer. They're great. And there's another band, all female band called Antagonizer. That's super fun. They're more in the like Celtic Frost vein. Super fun. Rad, young, really young. And there's a really raging like noise scene here, uh, which is interesting. You know, a lot of different bands that are, or groups or, or, or you know, things that, that happen that I'm not necessarily super plugged into, but every time I go, it's always mind blowing. Um, and then John has a, a oi band. John, the drummer from Asphalt Parade, that's that's really good, called Wired Up, uh, that everybody should uh, check out. They're pretty killer. All right, man. Uh, last question. What scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Oh, man. I mean, everything. I mean, that's, that's a hard question. I mean, I think just to go back to the start local, right? I mean, that's 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 where it happens, you know. If your local scene is healthy and people are active and cool shit's happening, cooler shit comes and it becomes the exchange, you know, and, and I think that is that that idea of putting in the work has helped me in a lot of different ways. Right. And, you know, on top of the whole, you know, DIY concept of, you know, I couldn't get a show in Gainesville for my band. So fuck it. I'll just have shows in my living room. That's really how it started. And so that's. I, I take that still to this day as well, right? Fuck it, I do it myself. That's kind of a, I love that kind of concept. And, you know, one thing I think about, you kind of touched on the hardback a little bit, you kind of giggle at the skinhead thing. You know, it's uh, it's funny, we caught a lot of shit back then, um, Drew and I did, because we would let everyone come to the bar. and We wouldn't, like, ban people, right? Irregardless of who they were. And, you know, obviously, if someone started a fight, they would have to leave. But we always wanted a place that was open for everyone. And, in, like, if we shun the skinheads, where, well, how would they ever learn, or, like, to be cooler? Like, how would they ever be exposed to different things? And, and being skinhead is fucking awesome in some way, right? And they're not all fucking terrible. It's like... Just because you have a shaved head, boots and braces, you know, doesn't mean you're terrible. And just because you are wearing a cool band shirt doesn't mean you're awesome. You know, I mean, there's fucking idiots in all presentations and rappers. And I thought, you know, 
just that one group of people, but there, that, that kind of, you know, was across everything, you know, we would let everyone in there. And that was always something that I was really, that was important to me. And I also, I did a volunteer record store here. I found it called Wayward Council that was open for like 15 years. And one of the things that was really important to me there was the same thing of, the, of you know, there was this huge movement that they wanted to put like a, a this is our ethics on the wall and I would never let them. And one thing that was cool is I, I, you know, since I kind of started it and I, I held the lease to the building and I actually did all the books and everything, I could kind of make some unilateral decisions, but I wouldn't force the hand. But my point was, you know, you can't make people act a certain way that you can't put anti-racist, anti-homophobic on the wall and expect that to be the reason people act that way. That's fucking stupid. That's cowardly, right? You know, if, if there's a bunch of misogynistic, racist people in this building, then that's what it should be. And if you want it to not be that, then you should be here to make sure that that's the pre- prevalent vibe. You know what I mean? Just because you spray paint it on a wall doesn't mean anything, right? That's like saying that people get married, but they won't get divorced. That doesn't mean anything. It's it's just a it's just a word, and so and that was a hard thing for a lot of people to to swallow because they wanted that postcard, they wanted that picture of like, look, we're we're you know we're anti you know Antifa, you know we're you know you know Nazis in the trash can, which I all I love all that stuff of course, but it, to me it's more important to to live that than to 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 wear it or spray paint it. You know what I mean, like. That doesn't do any. The symbol doesn't do anything. The action does everything, and and that's something that sometimes people can lose sight of. 